This week, a lecture about the economic history of the Industrial Revolution in the United States and Great Britain. The really big innovation of the 19th century was not the steam engine, nor the railroad, nor any specific product, but rather the system of machine production and the way in which the leading economies of the world generalized from that. They used the processes to make other things. More with George Mason University professor John Nye in a moment. This episode is brought to you by Shopify. Forget the frustration of picking commerce platforms when you switch your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling wherever you sell. With Shopify, you'll harness the same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash tech. Okay, let's get started. Um, in this second half of the material, we're going to be discussing mass production and the American system of manufacturers. Now, as you well know, um, there are differences in the way economists and historians discuss issues. In particular, I would sort of say historians place a great emphasis on archival information, uh, descriptive statistics, and um, testimony that was contemporary to the time. In contrast, social scientists, especially economists, look very much for big overarching themes or a framework that will connect it together. And sometimes that means ignoring the, the details of the specifics of the historical events that are involved. And what we're going to try to do is to try to bring both in today by looking at a debate or rather a literature on mass production and the assembly line that as articulated by economists, but then using that framework to think about the issues by using as examples a couple of the major historical transformations in several industries. In particular, we're going to talk about both the firearms industry as well as the typewriter. Now, one of the things we should probably first talk about is something called the American system of manufacturing. That is, in the 19th century, uh, writers towards the end of the 19th century started using the term to refer to mass production as it developed in the United States. Although, of course, in the early phases of that development, nobody actually used that term. But there was also an awareness throughout the early part to middle of the 19th century that the United States was developing along slightly different lines than Britain. In particular, their emphasis on, whenever possible, um, assembly and mass production. And although, as we know that term today, a lot of what we're going to discuss barely qualifies as mass production. But of course, uh, we are going to talk about now the growth of that, of that era and talk about the ways in which the assembly line both built up and changed. Moreover, we're going to talk about the economic characteristics of things, particularly the nature of demand, the ratio of capital and labor, that affect the adoption or non-adoption of mass production. We first need to realize that when we think about mass production, we're thinking in its ideal form of full automation of the manufacturing process. Right? And I think there used to be cartoons in the 60s or 70s, there may be some now, in which people think about, you know, hypothetically, what is mass production? They think the future, somebody just presses one button, and everything from the, the corn or the material or the steel or the raw materials are picked up from something, and robots push everything through, through to the outlet, and even robots load the ships, and the ships are, you know, piloted by robots all the way to your home. Of course, that's not the way it works. So even today, we don't literally have full mass production. However, we've come a long way relative to its beginnings in the early 19th century. And in particular, what I want to talk about is I want to talk about the challenges faced by people engaging in mass production, both at that time and to some extent today in industries that are hard to, to, to convert to mechanization. In particular, 
Let's think about, we can break down this question of mass production into four general categories. The first is the assembly line itself. The very idea of the assembly line was, of course, enacted in primitive forms in many small workshops and stuff. But when we consider that idea today, we think of a system in which the assembly or the production of a product is based upon different groups or individuals or teams working on specialized portion of the production, which are then inputs or which are then combined with other inputs, other processed intermediate inputs from specialized groups, which are then recombined into the final product. That's what we mean by the assembly line, right? And, and that's distinct. That notion of the assembly line is very different from, for example, the second issue, which is the mechanization of the process. The assembly line is something that became much bigger in America than Britain, which was the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Mechanization, of course, was something that the British pioneered in terms of things like the whole idea of the steam engine itself, as well as the various machines used to improve both cotton spinning and weaving. This is part of the mechanization process. For example, early automation didn't necessarily mean that the machine did everything, but that the machine engaged in multiple movements or multiple processes that it might have taken dozens of people to do, but instead now a single worker, by simply running the machine, could engage in production of things that multiplied the potential for human labor to a much bigger set of output. And notice that the reason you separate it is that you could have an assembly line without mechanization. And of course, in the extreme case with robotics, you know, you can have mechanization without the human assembly line, but you have a different assembly line. But the idea is that usually it's easier to get the assembly line before you get the mechanization. Although the more mechanized you are, the easier it is to have an assembly line. Third, we can think of the importance of the creation of homogeneous parts for assembly. Right? So that England had a great deal of mechanization in the early phase of the Industrial Revolution, but these were not always producing homogeneous intermediate parts that could be assembled together. And the holy grail of homogenization is full interchangeability. As we will see, these did not come easy and in some sense never really fully came about till much later than this period. But the, the point is that this period was the beginning of the attempt to have mechanized assembly lines that led to homogeneous parts, which then were somewhat interchangeable. They were never fully interchangeable in many industries. But that partial interchangeability lowered the ratio of human labor to machine labor. And fourth and finally, there's a goal of the full machine assembly of the final parts. Think about the fact that even today, what we think was relatively simple production, say potato chips, still needs a human. As you, if you'll see, if you look at documentaries online, a lot of potato chip factories still have people who stand there when the potato chips come out before they enter in the bags. And their job is to look at ones that are burnt or undersized or particular or broken and like throw them off the line. That's something they could automate in theory, but they have found that it's cheaper to hire somebody to do that process at the end of what is essentially a fully mechanized automatic process. So, and ultimately, notice that even that choice of having a person there in the final uh, period before the packing of the, of the potato chips essentially is about the fact that you're weighing the relative costs of machines, which both involve the development of the machines, the maintenance of the machines, the test and, testing of the machines, and the continued use, and you making new machines that will be perform exactly the same task. One of the big problems always faced by inventors, especially in the earliest part of the Industrial Revolution, the late 18th century, the 1700s, was the lack of sufficient polish and sufficient quality in parts so that they could be used together. And of course, 
The previous issue, the problem interchangeability, you can guess, was a very big issue for which industry? What industry is a very big thing? What happens around the 1800s, early 1800s? No, the big catastrophic event that everybody worried about. No, no. Event, not production. Who was around after the French Revolution? Napoleon, the Napoleonic Wars. The Napoleonic Wars were very important, right? And they involved huge armies, far beyond the scale of wars in the 17th and 16th century. These were gigantic armies involving often conscripts or volunteers, which were of a scale that had not been seen you know, since Roman times, perhaps, and perhaps never seen before. The huge scale. And maybe the only thing to compare them would be maybe some of the struggles in Asia, particularly those involving the Chinese Empire and, say, the Mongols. And one of the bugaboos of that period, of the Napoleonic War, was the interchangeability of parts. For example, even with the early steam engine, people took for granted that there would be a lot of final fitting. Parts didn't always fit together. Nails were not uniform. People often had a machine, and they had to sort of bang it together, even if it sort of worked. They had to constantly be tinkering with it to get it to work all the time. We're so used to cars that rarely break down today that we forget that even as late as the 60s and the 70s, most cars were really unreliable. You had to bring them to the shop very often. Against that fact, however, cars in the, say, 50s and 60s were more purely analog. There weren't these digital parts you had to worry about. So many of those things were easy to work on by people who were mechanically inclined at home. But this is the way almost everything was, even more so earlier on, when every machine had to be adapted. Moreover, when your machine broke down, you had to accept the fact that when you bought a new part, you had to be able to work with that part to get it to fit right. And you couldn't simply take another machine that was not broken or or a broken machine and cannibalize it for parts and use it on yours without quite a bit of wood or metal work. So these things were part of the issues people worried about. And in war, this was a really big deal because one of the basics of war is to apply arms. So the Napoleonic Wars, you start to seeing arms really used in mass quantities. But the problem you have is many of the guns were very different. And so what you have problems that even though the basic design of the gun is very simple, the parts were not at all interchangeable. There was neither homogeneity nor interchangeability of the parts. And this is one of the areas in which the U.S. pioneered. So we're going to talk about that. Um, Behind this, of course, are the background considerations, which include labor and capital markets with the overall capital equal to the labor ratios, driving a lot of the adoption, right? You would expect, for, for example, even today, in many countries where labor is very cheap, it's often easier to hire people to perform parts of the menial tasks. In contrast, in high-wage economies, like you see in the United States or Western Europe, things that in other countries would be taken for granted, why don't you just get somebody to do it? It's easier to create the machine. And remember that machines often started out by being less effective at producing things than humans. That is, early machine-created products tended to be of lower quality. It is only later, as the machines evolve and become more specialized, the precision and uniformity that can be created with machines allows you to produce things that are far more reliable, and, and certain things get higher quality. In other things, humans are still better. So, for example, take something like for all the accomplishments of machine processing, right? OCR systems don't work very well yet. You still have a fair number of errors when you're scanning books. And in order to make them clean, you actually have to pay a human being to look through them and correct the OCR errors a machine makes. I remember when in the early 90s, people said, oh, in another 20, 25 years, this will essentially be perfect. It's 20, 25 years later, it's not perfect yet, not by a long shot, right? So these are the kinds of things in which humans still have a major advantage relative to machines. Nathan Rosenberg, in particular, looked at this literature 
and was one of the ones to look at the system of manufacturers in America from the standpoint of thinking about the diffusion of process. One of the things we don't realize is that the diffusion of process may be as important as the inventions within the industry itself. In fact, Rosenberg claims the really big innovation of the 19th century was not the steam engine, nor the railroad, nor any specific product, but rather the system of machine production and the way in which the leading economies of the world generalized from that. They used the processes to make other things. So, for example, we're going to look at the way in which firearms developed and became more refined in the processes. And over time, those processes became so generalized that many of their systems could be used to make things like typewriters. Right? Indeed, Rosenberg, who studied a lot the problem of development in the third world, often stressed the fact that the third world was not always ready. These countries that were poor and less developed, either because of policy choices or unwillingness, were simply unable to adapt a lot of US technologies or Western technology in general. One of the most naive things about the post-war era, particularly in the 1950s, was the belief that all poor countries needed was help with financing and capital accumulation and new know-how. But it turns out know-how is very difficult to transfer. You see today that even in China, you, many of the things that are outsourced, that are you know, things like made by, say, the iPhone or something like that, are often considered to be better made in Chinese factories run by US managers than Chinese factories making similar phones run by Chinese managers. Part of that is because the whole package of goods and services that go into what is a modern tool or a modern product often involves things that are outside the simplistic manufacturing requirement. So today we take for granted a lot of the product is the look, the design. We care about the warranty. We care about the nature of customer service. We care about the guarantees of on-time delivery, the network of suppliers. All these things are part of that innovation. Well, in the 19th century, much of what you were seeing was an attempt to get one of the four pieces. So let's write them on the board so that we recognize them. Right, so we're talking, let's just sim we'll call it assembly line. Right. Second, we're going to talk about mechanization. Third, homogeneity. Leading to a degree of interchangeability. And fourth, final assembly. So Rosenberg's claim is that machine production and all the accompanying support products of machine production, in particular measures, proper gauges, proper measures, proper tools in some sense for measuring and producing copies of other tools, is part of what allowed for a rapid diffusion in the United States of these growing manufacturing techniques. And also, we're going to talk about the difference between government demand for product and private demand. Private demand is, could either be more or less demanding of quality than, than the government demand. demand. Government has specific political purposes they have, such as winning a war or needing something for policing or needing something for the building of certain types of uh, structures, these are very specific and they are less driven by market forces and more by political forces than the private market. 
where the private market is going to balance out what the consumer's tastes are with what they can afford. And it makes a big difference whether you're selling to a mass market or whether you're selling to a highly specialized market. We'll talk about that in a second, too. And so we're going to talk about the firearms industry because that's a lot of where the earliest assembly lines that were successful were seen. You saw people like Eli, Whit Eli Whitney claim to have a engaged in mass production techniques early. But in fact, he didn't really do that for the most part, as most of his stuff was still very much handmade. He claimed to have, you know, he, his work with other, a variety of products, including the firearms, were things that he had often claimed a pioneering success in the assembly line, but in fact, most historians now say most of his ideas were bunkum. And of course, as we'll see here, there was a tendency for successful American manufacturers to exaggerate the extent to which they had succeeded in creating a functioning assembly line, even the ones we now see who are relatively successful. So, the first thing we're going to talk about is firearms. But before that, we need to review what is, goes on into a firearm, right? And the two most common firearms that have to be produced are rifles and handguns. In both of them, you need a barrel. You need a means of loading the bullets. And you need a trigger action mechanism, a mechanism that allows you to fire the bullet so that it is charged and sent off. Furthermore, the bullet itself is very complicated. Right? Early on, the bullets were mostly a system of putting powder inside the long rifle barrel and then putting a ball that was dropped into it that was a little bit tight, and you jammed that ball into the musket, into the barrel of the musket. And then you had what was called a flintlock. That is, you had a mechanism which struck a flint, which then lit something which was easily combustible, and that sometimes something like a stick, I mean a stick, a, a string, say an oil or something, which then transferred the fire to the powder, which exploded and fired the gun. Unsurprisingly, this was not very accurate very often, early on. But throughout the 19th century, Improvements were made in both rifles and handguns. And, in, for example, the rifle eventually developed rifling, <laughs> which we use for handguns. I mean, rifling, that's to say, you're using grooves that go through the bore of the rifle, which are used to impart spin to the bullet, so that they are not the bullet is not destabilized. The creation of the conical ball. So, for example... The balls that look like this, and early ones were like this, by Minier in Europe, were, became essential because they were much more accurate than the simple round balls that had been used earlier. In fact, the Minier ball, which in America was known as the mini ball, uh, the mini ball was in some sense essential to the Civil War. Part of the mini ball and the improved rifling and the improved muskets are part of what made the Civil War vastly more, if you like, sanguinary. It was easier to kill people in the Civil War than it had been in Napoleonic times. Very often in Napoleonic times, you had to come with quite close before you got reasonable hits with their system of rifles, and that allowed you to charge people. In contrast, by the Civil War, one of the things people learned was that rows of muskets alternately fired. One row at the time was almost like machine fire. It was like a, a rolling mach machine gun, except it was just different w rows of men firing. That would often stop uh, people marching up to you in, in, at speed before they even got within 100 yards. This is why you got many charges, say, up hills or something, like the famous Pickett's Charge, which led to very many deaths. But to get there, they had to figure out improved ways of manufacturing. And the man who did a lot to push the assembly line for guns 
was someone who was working not in rifles, but in handguns. And that man was Samuel Colt. Samuel Colt, interestingly enough, was a kind of huckster. He had a lot of good ideas, but he always liked to embellish his life. So it's always hard to figure out which parts of his claims are true and false. So, for example, he claimed he thought of the idea of a rotating cylinder while he was working on a ship for a year. And some people doubt whether that's true or not. Moreover, he was not the only one to experiment with the rotating cylinder. When, when Samuel Colt developed his first firearm, which is known as the Patterson Colt, because it was made in Patterson, New Jersey, um, Samuel Colt did not, in fact, patent the cylinder because he knew that was not patentable at that time. In fact, a lot of what he patented was the way in which the cylinder fit in the gun and the loading of the bullet. You may not realize this. We're so used to thinking of the six-shooter as they develop later on, as something you just load six bullets and fire, that the early Patterson Colt actually required you to load the powder into the cylinder and to load the bullet separately. And then you had to put a primer cap, a cap which would ignite for each bullet in the gun. And in fact, fully loading the Patterson Colt was often quite cumbersome, which is why it was not initially adopted by the U.S. military. That is, you had to partially take open, basically take apart the gun before you could reload it. So it is true they could fire several shots, but it was not as effective and it was very complicated. Colt also had a bad habit that the man he charged to design the actual creation of the gun, that turned his ideas into an actual weapon, was often not paid by Colt. He was always stringing people along and getting into debts and doing things. In fact, early on, he, um, he used to create this medicine show. That is, how did he support himself while he was trying to design his first gun? He went around the country with shows in which he subjected members of the audience to laughing gas. And then while they were in the state, have them do a bunch of tricks. So it was, it's totally different when you think of it. And he always talked about how great his gun was. And he made claims that he couldn't always back up. In fact, he went bankrupt. He was, he was about to close completely when he was very lucky because several of his colts were used by the Texas Rangers when fighting native Indians. And they found that that was so successful and shocked the native Indians because their normal base of attack was to expect that the soldiers would fire one round and then take a long time to reload. So then they would charge them at that point. But then facing a whole group of Texas Rangers with repeating firearms was something that was a shock to them because now these people without reloading were just recocking the hammer were basically able to take six shots within a minute. And so much so that Colonel Walker pushed this idea and asked the U.S. government, the ordinance, to order these guns for the army. And in fact, Colt, that's the beginning of Colt's success. And in fact, he promised to produce 10,000 guns when he didn't have a factory or any means of doing so. So he had all these kinds of issues. But Colt was a very good hustler. And he eventually got to the point where he did set up his factory and he did promote the idea of the assembly line. So he was able to use the idea of having different groups on the assembly line. One of his claims, which is now shown to be false, was the claim that his parts were completely interchangeable. So one of the tricks he liked to do was to take, say, a bunch of handguns that were identical, or at least their same model, and then take them apart and then mix up the parts and put them together. And so one of the things that the British saw when he was giving these exhibitions was the perception that Colt parts were all interchangeable. But that turns out to have been you can call it a lie or you can call it a slight exaggeration of the truth. That is, in practice, what he did do was create parts that were very similar, but while they were hot, they were then hand-shaped and fitted to each gun. That is, you can bet, therefore, that the parts that he brought along to demonstrate interchangeability were carefully hand-finished to make sure they were interchangeable. But Colt could not guarantee, in fact, to the end of his life, that the parts that he called interchangeable were, in fact, interchangeable to the standard we would talk about today. Now, of course, 
Part of the reason for that is that the demand for interchangeability in military firearms is of a much higher standard than you would get with consumer goods. To give you an alternative at the similar time as the firearms industry was developing, the early clock making manufacturers, that's making small clocks for home use, were making clocks with a number of interchangeable wooden parts. But part of the reason they're able to do this is the parts were much simpler to, to, to machine, and the standard of interchangeability was much lower. So that they produced low quality clocks, which weren't all that accurate, but they were more than adequate for the home market, of people wanting a general timekeeper that wasn't as precise as the best handmade, say, pocket watches. So these things were cheaper, and they were widely popular among Americans, particularly in the middle classes. So you can, think of, you can see how different it is, what the nature of the demand is. Moreover, as time passed, the U.S government and the British understood that interchangeability was not necessarily the same thing as homogeneity. And early on, everyone started the assembly line thinking about it as saving money. But quickly, the US government realized that interchangeability was a quality they wanted in a final product for its own virtues, even if it cost more. Because very often, the assembly line, to the extent it required a great deal of skilled hand finishing, would often cost more, both in terms of setting up the machine shop, hiring people, training them, etc., than doing everything by hand. But it had the advantage it could make things more quickly. And then interchangeability was something they aimed at that they hoped in the future would be the case. And they wanted it so much, they were willing to pay in the hopes of getting something interchangeable. But it took many decades before they even came close to that. The British noted that American guns made on an assembly line were more uniform, but of lower quality than British guns. British guns throughout the 19th century were more carefully finished, and they were done by hand. Part of this was because Britain didn't have a big war after the Crimean War up to World War I. So what do you think was the major demand for guns in the UK in the 19th century? Hunting. Hunting, or sport. So the two things are people shooting clay, skeet, this kind of thing, right? So using for hunting and shooting. Moreover, these were often demanded by the higher classes not the lower ones, and so they paid for a lot of things that were not essential, say, to a military weapon. They, didn't, they, they wanted something that was more than mil-spec. They wanted embroidered or, you know, in, you know what you call as elaborated designs on the barrel or on the stock or things like that. A lot of fine wood, fine finishing, right? The smoothing out of, of the barrels. These things are things that are very much a high-end demand factor. Actually, you see some of these things today, too. Um, one big difference, for example, is that if you look today, the U.S. has the most open laws, particularly in about half its states, for gun ownership. So gun ownership is widest in the U.S. than in any other country in the world. That means the U.S. market is predominantly a mass market. Even though the military is a big buyer of weapons and ammunition, the bulk of the demand for guns in the United States, both handguns and rifles, are people who are not very demanding. They just want it to go bang and be pretty accurate. As a result, what you see is this bifurcation in the United States where the big manufacturers make guns that are pretty good, and you have these very small custom shops making guns for things like competitions to a very high exacting, exacting product, but at a very high cost. In contrast, Europe gun demand is much more limited. They, most countries essentially ban handguns or make it very difficult to get handguns. Or only allow rifles that are not military in purpose, but primarily for sport. 
say for target shooting or for hunting. As a result, their demands are higher end, and so that their average finishing is much higher. Even their ammunition, um, for example, the only firearms still allowed in the Olympics are those shooting the 20, small rimfire 22 caliber bullets. And most, if not probably, I would say all the best bullets that are Olympic quality are made in Europe, either England or the continent. No US manufacturer makes 22 caliber bullets that are of a high enough standard to be used in target competition, whether in the United States or abroad. That is, most of the bullets for the US are primarily used for plinking and short range hunting. That is, the most common use is that either you're just shooting at the range for fun or you're using it to, say, shoot squirrels or other small varmints. And so that's a very different market. In fact, one U.S. manufacturer tried to make high-end bullets several years ago, one of the largest, CCI, and they actually closed it down because they found that the costs of been doing this were just not worth it in the American environment. That is, the rate of return they were getting for their capital did not justify that investment. So that we see with the cult that Samuel Colt was able to make improvements over time in the guns, but he had... He had to, in some sense, half invent a lot of things. So he was very good at marketing, which people didn't think about. He was very good at developing factories. That is, he was very famous for his factories in Hartford, Connecticut, being early places in which you had the paternalistic system. There were, there were rudimentary recreation facilities for them. There was an attempt to provide schooling for many of the young girls who worked there. There was an attempt to sort of internalize the externalities of the labor market by keeping everything within a town that was growing rapidly and where business would come in. And during the Civil War, for example, he faced the problem that initially he sold to both the North and the South. But then, fearing the bad, that this would look bad, he stopped selling to the South. It's not unlike what you see today with the Ukraine war, where you know, she royal, the Shell, Royal Dutch Shell, actually bought one of the shipments of Russian oil that couldn't find a buyer. And now Shell has been running around saying, mia culpa, mia culpa. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'll never do it again. (laughs) And you can sort of see how that's more about public opinion than necessarily the ideas of the owners of those companies as well. So that in this case, the choice was the government's. And indeed, military drove a lot of the early development of guns. It's one of the re- but in the United States, it wasn't just the military, just the Civil War, but that American farmers needed guns to protect themselves in the West and to protect themselves when they were farming, both against each other and as well as attacks from, say, native Indians, as well as from dealing with wild animals. So that these guns often developed to support the needs of American farmers and ranchers. So much so that many of the best weapons throughout the 19th century are American. Everything from the Data Six Shooters, Smith & Wesson, Colt, Remington's firearms, the guns that were developed to be lever rifles like you see on cowboy shows. These were early attempts at early successes in getting multiple firing uh, rifles. The earliest rifles that shot multiple rounds were lever action. They continued to be perfected all throughout the 20th century. Perhaps the greatest arms designer of all time, John Moses Browning, lived and worked in the late 19th and early 20th century. John Moses Browning was in Ogden, Utah, and he and his brothers had a rifle shop. And he was one of these guys that was at the time when you could still have a small workshop develop new ideas and send them off to the East Coast. In fact, he, when he sent one of his designs to the East Coast, the Winchesters were so impressed that they actually came to visit Ogden, Utah to see what was going on. And John Moses Browning was, of course, responsible for hordes of the most famous guns that ever, that ever existed, including the 50 caliber BMG, machine gun that was used in World War I and World War II and is still used today, including the Browning automatic rifle, and most famous of all, the Colt 45, 
the 45 handgun, which is referred to by most gun uh, buyers as the 1911, because that's when it was, that's the model number of it. And it was called the Colt 45, because Colt made it, but we think all the ones made by Colt, as well as all the copies today, are considered to, are called 1911s. And the 1911 is very unusual because it was one of the first handguns that could fire and reload rounds without any cocking. You pulled, up, you pulled uh, it was fully semi-automatic. You pulled the first shot, and the rifle simply cycled out the old case, and the new bullet came in. The U.S. did not invent that system. The Germans or the Austrians did, so the early Mauser and the Luger were developed before the Browning. However, the Browning 1911 is the only weapon from that time period, which is still in use today by some militaries and law enforcement officers. So it tells you about the quality of that design that he developed. But again, all this would not have been possible without precise manufacturing tools and the rise of a system for mass production that could both make large quantities, which became essential for the military, obviously in World War I and World War II, and get them of high enough standard so that they became virtually interchangeable and were relatively reliable. In contrast, let's look at something like the typewriter. You may, what do you know about the history of the typewriter? For example, what kind of keyboard layout do we use today? QWERTY. QWERTY. Do you know what people say about that? Why we have that QWERTY keyboard layout? Well, originally, they laid it out like in alphabetical order, but people would get, like when they typed fast enough, things would get confused, so it would clog up a lot. And that's just one of the early stories, although that, that now there are some people who are recent scholars are questioning the, uh, the authenticity of that claim. What they really say happened is that the early typewriter was being used heavily by people involved in telegraphy and, more, and sending, send, that is to say post. They're sending telegraph messages out and they're typing with that and the things they had to type were heavily determining what worked better. And so they were inputs into the development and spread of the QWERTY system. It didn't hurt that the QWERTY was first used by Scholes. That is, Scholes invented the first practical typewriter. There were a large number of precursor inventors who had a kind of printed type machine early on, but none of them were viable at the individual level and not very economic. Scholes, who in, was in Wisconsin, Milwaukee, in concert with Glidden, another industrialist, built the first couple of hundred units. And they were able to sell, but they were very high quality units requiring massive amounts of hand finishing. So these were not at all mass production items. So much so that they found that almost all their profits were being eaten up by the cost of manufacturing. Given that the machine was popular, but given that they could not find a way to lower cost, they tried to simplify it, but ultimately realized they needed someone with experience in machine tools and machine production to make the typewriter. So what did they do? They approached the Remington Arms Company. They approached the Remington Arms Company in the early 1870s, and in 1873, they basically became a part of the Remington Company. And in fact, they had a deal where I think something like only one third of the profits were to go to Scholes and his group, and the other two thirds or 60% were to go to Remington. So for all intents and purposes, Remington now owned this new typewriter design. And it's Remington who came out with what they called the Scholes Glidden typewriter. Remington was also the ones who invented the name typewriter, even though it was originally two words. It was type dash writer. It was a separate word. Words were separated by dash, so you had this term typewriter, which has since become commonplace. And so that, that, that actually flourished, and the manufacturing techniques that Remington had perfected with making firearms, 
they found had real benefits in terms of learning how to simplify the typewriter design, improving its reliability, and still making it cheap enough to sell. Remember, one of the, we, in economics, we distinguish between invention and innovation. Right? As Schumpeter points out, invention is the mere creation of the initial device. But the actual creation of the device for a market so that it becomes a viable product is what we think of as true innovation. That is, for economists, innovation is about the process of taking inventions and making them into a practical product that has an actual market. And in that sense, it's Remington who did the first really good job with creating an economical, useful, and high-quality typewriter. One of the ironies of this story is that Remington was engaged in a lot of mismanagement in the 70s and 80s, so much so that they went into receivership at the end of the 19th century. But before they went into receivership, they sold off the Remington Typewriter Corporation. So it became a separate company, the Remington Typewriter Corporation. And that separate company is very famous because they started going into office machine products. And that company became Remington Rand. And Remington Rand built things like the early, some of the earliest large computers, like Univac. Right? So the Univac system was produced by Remington Rand. Remington Rand was later merged with Sperry. Right? So it began under the, the Sperry Corporation. And Sperry eventually swallowed up and merged and changed its name to Unisys. So you have this evolution from right, a small typewriter, typewriter maker attached to a giant firearms manufacturer, evolving into office products and today being a major source of business computer systems. So you see the way this evolved. And the typewriter, as you can expect, had very different demands from that of the firearms. Remember that in all these cases, we have to think about the fact that you needed gauges. So one of the very first things Samuel Colt's firms pioneered was the creation of precise gauges so that you could measure carefully what the tolerances were of the products you were making so that you could see that they were within a certain kind of tolerance. And then later on, Remington made it a habit of having a model machine when they were going to produce something, that machine would always remain in one place. And that model machine was used to make copies, which were then the machines that were used to produce new products. And you went back to the model machine when making new machines. Ultimately, Rosenberg points out the success of the United States in this was greatly aided by the fact that the machine, the, the people who made the machines, were initially the corporation themselves. The company themselves, not the corporation, the company, right? If they were making machines to produce guns, machines to produce typewriters, they made them in-house. But then they got to be creating a separate division or something attached to it. They had the makers of the machines attached to the company itself. Eventually, these evolved into totally independent companies. And the irony is that these companies we're making machines for a general set of companies, but their specialization was making machines specialized for the needs of a particular company. So they were general companies making specialized machines. And if you think about that, what does this remind you of, this whole process of going from inside the firm to outside and becoming a new market? What does this remind you of in economics? What theory do we talk about in institutions? And the theory of the firm, right? What is the theory of the firm, right? Remind you that Ronald Coase's work on the theory of the firm are about the fact that the firms are created when the outside market is not reliable or not efficient. And therefore, they have to make things in-house. And they're making them things in-house because the transactions costs of dealing with the market, especially if the market doesn't exist, are too high. As the outside market grows, as many more things can be outsourced in the market, there is a more clear-cut division between what things only they can make in-house and what things are made outside. Ultimately, these things feed into the general problem 
of the assembly line, which is still one of the issues that's coming today. Nathan Rosenberg, who talked about this, and particularly the role of machine tools, was a professor at Stanford, and he was also quite influential in Silicon Valley in the early 90s. In the early 90s, a lot of people in Silicon Valley were trying to understand what parts of the business could you take in existing businesses and automate thanks to the internet versus what things could not be done. One of the things that's always debated, for example, is the extent to which video calls and phone calls can substitute for face-to-face. -face. So one of the things we've had experience with in this pandemic is that there are certain types of jobs where you can outsource certain types of meetings. On the other hand, there are certain types of situations, particularly where a lot of teamwork is required, and there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of fast movement in which you actually need the teams to be working close together to get the optimal benefit of their innovation. These are still some of the products we grapple with today. Finally, if you think about the role of mass production, which in many ways becomes, hits its peak in the Ford General Motors era, that's when you get what is, we think of as mature mass production with relative homogeneity and a very well-functioning assembly line, we still have to realize now that most of what we buy is not the product. We are not paying. When you buy meat in a grocery store, you're not often paying for the meat. You're paying for all the processes to prepare, cut, weigh, measure, and package that stuff, and then transport it to the supermarket so you can buy it for your home. And a lot of that comes about because you have a system worldwide, at least among the developed economies, that has created a very good system for either buying, outsourcing a lot of things they can buy from foreign intermediaries, whether they be in China or elsewhere, and combining them with things that are only made in-house within a support and service and marketing system that is also very well developed in the home country. We're going to talk some more about this and the issues of what things impede development, what things impede the adoption of technology next week, or rather the week after the break, when we will be discussing why was China not first with the Industrial Revolution. That's it for now. Thank you. Good. Thanks for listening to C-SPAN's Lectures in History podcast. If you're interested in hearing more history, check out our podcast, First Ladies, in their own words, using material from C-SPAN's award-winning biography series, First Ladies, and source material from C-SPAN's video library, you'll listen to first spouses addressing issues important to them and the country. The program includes eight modern first ladies, from Lady Bird Johnson to Melania Trump. First Ladies, in their own words, wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs>